Um, as many of you um, come talk about the loss of smell and taste um, that can occur with COVID-19, this week we'll focus on diagnostic testing. So as many of you may know, diagnostic testing is vitally important in healthcare, especially now. After reading some of the assigned articles um, from the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, you may have you know, a slight understanding of some of the challenges and controversies that have arisen with the COVID-19 diagnostic testing. Today, we have the honor and privilege of hearing from Dr. Uh, Powers Fletcher about how COVID-19 diagnostic tests are developed, approved, expedited, expedited, and the different types of tests as well. Dr. Powers Fletcher is a professor in the Infectious Diseases Division and completed her PhD at our very own UC College of Medicine and pathobiology and molecular medicine. She also completed a fellowship at the University of Utah in medical and public health laboratory microbiology. Another thing to note was that she was a co-PI with Dr. Ficknobaum for the Moderna vaccine trial here at UC, which is absolutely amazing. So thank you so much, Dr. Powers Fletcher for coming to speak to our class and really excited to learn from you. The floor is all yours. Wonderful, thank you so much and hello to everyone. I'm very excited to be part of this new course. I think it is so cool that this has been put together. Um, so I'm working on sharing my screen here. There we go. And I've got my speakers and let me just get my chat box up and going. So as we were kind of saying at the beginning here, I am happy with this being as informal as, as people want. So feel free to interrupt if you've got a question, you want me to talk about something in, in more detail, happy to go that. I'll also be paying attention to the chat box as we go um, to be talking about uh, things that, that you might put up in the chat box um, there. Um, great introduction. I appreciate that. And um, here are a bit of the lecture objectives. And I mean, this is a giant topic, as is everything that you guys are trying to cover with this course, and we continue to learn more. Um, so I will say, you know, a lot of the objectives here are based on, on general topics related to COVID-19 testing. So, you know, beginning, we kind of wanted just a general overview of how are diagnostics developed, approved, produced, things like that. Um, some basics distinguishing between PCR-based, antigen-based, and antibody tests, and then some of the bottlenecks along the way. Um, I'm not going to really be getting into extensive detail on individual tests and targets and things like that, because uh, for one, I thought it was beyond the scope of, of this lecture and, and perhaps this course. But also knowing that there's some just general considerations for test development and how we do things in the laboratory world that I think are, are really interesting. So Raul uh, kind of alluded to this, but I wanted to give you a bit of my background of, of where I'm coming from and where a lot of laboratorians are coming from in this. And so uh, he mentioned the, the fellowship that I did. So it was a CPEP fellowship. And, i um, happy to talk about this type, type of career path with anyone who's interested um, at some other date, but uh, I, I did a fellowship after doing my PhD, my doctoral training um, in medical and public health laboratory microbiology. And so in this fellowship, this just highlights some key things of what would be covered in such a fellowship. So diagnostic bacteriology, mycology, parasitology, virology, antimicrobial testing, molecular diagnostics, as well as some general categories about lab management, epi, public health, lab safety, things like that. And so really what that helps um, individuals like myself prepare to do is direct um, microbiology labs and in, in two settings, one clinical microbiology and the other public health microbiology. And I think this is an important distinction um, especially in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, because it is a big part of the conversation we're having in terms of this. So clinical microbiology, uh, when we talk about that, we uh, focus on, of course, investigating microorganisms that cause infectious diseases. But this often happens in a very defined universe within a hospital setting or perhaps you know, private practice reference laboratories, but very much for individual patient care. How do we identify the things that cause disease? How do we treat them? How do we prognose or determine you know, if someone is recovering and monitoring therapy? This is in contrast to public health microbiology, which um, is focused on, on, of course, investigating microorganisms that pose a threat to the public's health. Um, oftentimes, public health laboratories encompass topics that are not necessarily focused on an individual. So things like um, environmental testing or, you know, 
uh, food outbreaks and, and microbes, again, that affect in, impact populations rather than individuals. There are public health laboratories that do provide individual patient testing for um, uninsured uh, patients or, or patients without access to health care. Um, and then, you know, dealing with things like bio threat agents that, again, have a, a more national or, or population type of impact. So they are, are two distinct worlds when it comes to laboratory science. But then you get something like a pandemic where those lines start getting very blurry. And I think that's a, an entirely um, interesting and, and unique aspect of this pandemic and laboratory testing is, is where does some of this actually fall? So I really wanted to emphasize and show some examples, knowing that not um, many, and, and if we're all in the same room, I might ask you to raise hands and, and talk to me about this, of who's ever heard of a clinical laboratory, who's ever been in a clinical microbiology laboratory, things like that. But um, at least this point, we'll assume that, that maybe not everyone has. And so this is some images of the UC Health Clinical Laboratory, and they're fairly new images because we've got these really fancy robots. Um, uh, a traditional clinical microbiology laboratory would not look um, this new age, that's for sure. But this is a, this space where all of our diagnostic testing for infectious diseases happen. And again, laying some of the foundation or, or groundwork here, oftentimes, um, you know, and historically, the approaches uses, used in clinical microbiology began using culture-based based approaches. So I, they're using solid or liquid media cultures that would grow certain organisms, and these being incubated and read. We use the word read in the laboratory a lot, meaning we interpret the growth using a, you know, standard protocols that people love to put in algorithms and book chapters and make people memorize. And then we look at all of that to order to identify a potential pathogen. So this is all, all very standard traditional approaches. And, and since that culture-based approach, and sorry, I couldn't get this figure to ever come out less blurry than this, um, but there's a lot of ways that microbiology techniques have advanced along the way. Um, you know, and, and we divide some of this into direct detection. So showing here all of these, you know, different ways that we are directly looking in, in most part, some type of nucleic acid, but there's also things like flow where we might be looking for organisms themselves or labeled organisms um, and looking at serology testing. And, and then once we have something isolated, a variety of different approaches for identifying. So sequencing, microarrays, and then mass spec, looking at protein-based sequencing. Um, so really beyond that, you know, very classic culture-based clinical microbiology approach, laboratories have rapidly advanced and really using some, some novel technology uh, within the field. And so this takes us to kind of the, the approach of viral diagnostics. And this is just, a again, a very basic um, breakdown of things of the types of technology that were available when we we're thinking about viral diagnostics. So um, culture-based diagnostics still happen with virology. Not a lot of places, but where I trained for fellowship, we had a large virology laboratory where we were still incubating specimens in cell culture and looking for the virus to change the, the cytopathic um, or the cytology, the cytopathic effect of viruses in cell culture and being able to use that to identify what virus is present. That's a very classic virology approach. Um, but also using other th things for direct detection. So looking for nucleic acid, genome detection, looking for antigen, and then those indirect methods that we'll talk about today, but you know, looking for antibodies against those pathogens. So there's a lot of, there were a lot of tools at our disposal in clinical and public health um, microbiology laboratories, and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And I would argue, um, and I think a lot of individuals would support me, that much of our country and much of the world had never thought about a single laboratory diagnostic test ever in their life, all of that kind of preamble that I gave you, this foundation of clinical microbiology and molecular diagnostics, never crossed a lot of people's minds. And since the pandemic, um, we now have conversations about testing 
in in platforms and in environments where we never thought we would be talking about a diagnostic platform. So it has definitely been an interesting experience for everyone. So this is just a quick look at, at the pandemic and we'll zoom in a little bit here, but I think it's important to set the stage of, of when things were happening uh, at what time point. So uh, up at the top here, we're looking at the number of confirmed cases and um, some of this is a bit projected. This is of, of course not going um, to date, but as we're seeing the number of, of cases start rising and start appearing and what we're seeing of, of discussions of, you know, when it's first declared a pandemic by the WHO, when we're anticipating again, this publication um, is from, uh, you know, fall of 2020. So we don't necessarily know when our waves were going to come, but we definitely knew waves were coming. Um, you know, how we're up, uh, approaching um, lockdown and, and quarantine, but then what's going on, the, on on the lab side? So, you know, very early on, one of the key things, and, and hopefully this comes up in other lectures as well, especially, you know, more virus-based, one of the key things that really helped um, science move quickly here was having rapid sequencing available um, and rapid pathogen identification. Um, you know, when we relate this back to other pandemics, um, you know, notably the 1918 influenza pandemic, much of the response was just figuring out what the heck was going on, what was killing everyone. And there's some really interesting stories about the science um, that, that happened and things that were identified during that pandemic when we were just trying to figure out what the pathogen was. So it was really critical to the response that we were able to identify and isolate the pathogen, sequence it, and really help with test development and vaccine development and, and everything um, associated with that. Um, and then beginning looking at timing here of, of um, when tests became available. And so we'll dive into this in much greater detail, but you know, March 11th is when we have the pandemic um, or a pandemic situation declared by the WHO. March 12th is when we have the first EUA emergency use authorized um, commercial assay available. And then April 1st, we have our first serology test available. And so we'll talk about all of this test design um, phase here. And, and we really wanna dive into this a little bit more detail about what does this mean, um, design development validation, um, and how has it progressed since there? So again, trying to set some foundation here because I think that's what a lot of this has been is um, you know foundation of how did we used to do things and how are we being asked to do them now and again. This was an image that I liked that I just could not find in a in a better resolution here. But um, you know this process of in vitro diagnostic, you'll hear this a lot in IVD and in vitro diagnostic. That is what we refer to as all tests, all diagnostic tests that have been approved by the FDA in the United States. We call them IVDs. This is a years long process where, um, you know, with a lot of the things that go through a development and a, an approval process begin with basic research. So thinking about the idea, someone first saying, hey, I wanna see if we can find this, designing it, designing controls, how, you know, this initial step of just how is our test going to work? And then preclinical de development. So, you know, how, how are we getting it to, to perform and to optimize? And um, how are we going to propose that people are going to use it? When are they going to use it? Because all of that labeling is really important for when you try to get something approved by the FDA. Um, and then making a plan. So to get an, I, an IVD approved by the FDA, you submit and file all of this data and all of this paperwork that is associated with it about the performance and application of your test. And so to do that, you have to have a really um, well thought out, well planned uh, validation process in place in order to collect all the data that you need. It's an incredibly expensive process. Um, and so that is one barrier to things getting moved along in this process is the cost. And you know, are these manufacturers, are these companies that are gonna invest all of this time and money up front. So these stages all cost a lot of time and money. And if you don't get FDA approval and people don't use their your test, there is little, very little way for you to get reimbursed um, for any of that. 
And so it's a big risk. And you can we can talk about this in drug development, vaccine development, all of these different things that require development. There is a lot of investment at the front end for something that you don't know is necessarily going to get approved or work or be utilized in any meaningful way. Um, so a lot of this planning goes into place. And then the clinical trials, just like we do for pharmaceuticals and vaccines, there are clinical trials for in vitro diagnostics where they have to get tested in the field and get reviewed and, and have data to go along with it that then gets uh, presented to the FDA for approval. And it is only after that approval um, can they be used for clinical care. And, and really approval in terms of in vitro diagnostics really comes into most significant play in terms of regulation within the clinical laboratory and for all intents and purposes, reimbursement, insurance reimbursement. Um, FD, using a, an FDA approved in vitro diagnostic test is the easiest path to getting an insurance company or Medicare or Medicaid to pay for that diagnostic test. And so unfortunately, that is also a lot that drives the process here um, as well. So. Hopefully my, my lengthy explanation of this and, and talking about this has set the, the stage for this usually takes a really long time. Um, but we didn't have a long time for the pandemic. So what is introduced here, and you'll probably hear it most frequently talked about with the vaccines currently, but it was talked a lot about for diagnostic tests, this EUA, Emergency Use Authorization. And so what this does is something that the FDA, you still have to submit data for this, and um, the FDA, it is uh, something that they designate, but essentially it's within their power to allow this process to move more quickly and, and there to be um, in the, for the, the field of in vitro diagnostics, perhaps um, less clinical trial work, less work being done in, in performance um, to allow it to, to happen more quickly. And so right at the onset, um, there are two categories that have received an EUA designation for SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Um, first is a diagnostic test. And I really like this description here, so I wanted to show it. So a diagnostic test can show you if you have an active coronavirus infection and um, informs activities such as quarantine and isolating yourself. And there were two tests that fall within this category, molecular tests, such as real-time PCR, um, that is looking for uh, genetic material and antigen tests. So looking for specific proteins from the virus. And then there's antibody tests. So these is an indirect response looking for your immune system um, that has recognized this threat, this viral pathogen, and has made antibodies uh, against it. And then by detecting those antibodies, we can indirectly determine if you've been exposed. Because this is um, a, an indirect, and I can do a whole session on antibody testing and the limitations of antibody testing for infectious disease uh, diagnostics and, and monitoring, um, there's a lot of challenges associated with that. And at this point, we do not necessarily know what it means in terms of immune status and previous exposures and um, future risks. So at this time, um, it should not be used to, to diagnose, and it's very difficult to make clinical care decisions based on antibody testing uh, alone. So we'll jump into the diagnostic tests um, first. And again, like I said, we are just doing a very brief overview here of the basic principles. This is not going to be a whirlwind tour of all of the tests that are available, and, and, and nor is it intended to be. Um, but the, the most commonly um, um, used tests right now are molecular tests. So this is nucleic acid detection, diagnosing active infection, where you're obtaining some, some type of swab. Um, uh, primarily, this was starting with nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, however, uh, nasal or the interior na nasal swabs are acceptable. There's movement into alternative specimen sources as well, but we'll just say you know a nasal swab at this point. You then take that swab, um, it's put in a transport medium uh, to stabilize uh, the viral nucleic acid um, as it's being sent to the laboratory. At that point, we're extracting RNA from the specimen and converting it to DNA. 
so that it can be amplified and detected using SARS-CoV-2 specific primers. And then with that, we have some type of detection technique that allows us to interpret the results. And here, we're really looking for presence of viral RNA, um, which would indicate an active infection or lack of detection. And I think something that's important to highlight uh, for this is in the terminology here is using detected and not detected. You'll see this for all molecular diagnostics is detected versus not detective. We really try not to use the language of positive versus negative um, because that gives the uh, the notion that that we are really being able to speak definitively the state of positive negative. All molecular tests, because we're looking for nucleic acid, are limited to some extent by the amount of viral nucleic acid that they can detect. We call it a limit of detection or an LOD. All molecular assays have them um, and they vary. They're not always the same. And so when we say not detected, what we mean is that the virus was not detected at the level that we are able to detect at that limit of detection or the LOD. Uh, and so, you know, when we're thinking about different test performance and different test characteristics, if we just theoretically threw out numbers that said, okay, this, this assay can detect 10 units of virus. This assay over here can detect at the limit of detection is 100. And this one over here has a limit of detection of 1,000. We can test the same sample uh, that might have a different viral load in it and get wildly different results. And it is really all based on the limit of detection. And so that's a key component when we're thinking about um, interpreting tests such as this. The next direct detection and diagnostic test that's being offered is an antigen test. And so this is just an example of, of how antigen tests can work. So this is an example of a lateral flow assay um, where this is, you're showing strips. So, um, you know, think of this, the easiest case always to, to tell people to think about is like a pregnancy test, right? But where you've got this strip and it's got labeled bands on it here. So just walking through what we've got, um, this is before we've got um, a sample applied. And what we've got is we've got a control line, so control antibodies here. We've got antibodies here that are against a specific antigen. And then we've got here in where our sample is gonna be put, antibody that is also against the antigen, but is linked to a detector molecule, which is shown in red here. You would then, sorry, I've lost my mouse and I'm hoping you guys can see my mouse. Can anyone give me a shout out? Can you see me do this little mouse activity? We can see it. Awesome, thank you. And so then you put your sample here, which is represented by the green antigen. So, um, you know, we put to some type of respiratory sample here. And then what you have happen is your antibodies that were against that antigen bind to that. And this is where the lateral flow comes into play. So we have specimen move along this, this wick, this paper here. And the antigen, we create kind of a sandwich here where the antigen is gonna get bound by this, this um, line of antibody against antigen. And then it continues moving along and this control antibody, um, it tends to be is against the, the detector an antibody itself. And so you get them, them bound there. And then of course it keeps moving. If antigen is present, what you see happen is you have two lines and you can see it in this cartoon here. You've got your detector showing up at two places, um, both the line that we anticipated collecting just the antigen and then your control line. If your result does not have any antigen or your specimen does not have any antigen in it and it is negative, then just your detector antibody gets bound. You just see your control line, but you don't see anything at the, the band where you have your antigen specific antibody. Um, and so this is, I mean, they are, tend to be fairly easy to use. They are rapid because as you can see, this is this process, you just put it in, you, you wait for your specimen um, to move along along the, the paper and then you have your answer. However, because um, of the, the platform and the way it, it tends to work, uh, antigen testing tends, tends to have lower sensitivity and reduced specificity as it compares to molecular tests. Um, and we, we can talk about that 
Uh, I've got some slides at the end that kind of talk about sensitivity and specificity, and we can go into that a little bit more. So I just wanted to put this table up to, to show a comparison of the different tests available. So molecular um, versus antigen tests. Um, and then, um, so I see we got a question there. I'll, I'll circle back to that question. So um, molecular tests, so again, we're looking at viral genetic material, um, oftentimes using some type of amplification. Um, antigen, we're looking at a protein component uh, there. Sample types, again, we've got a comparison there. Um, laboratory or point of care, initially, um, you know, historically all molecular tests start as a, at a centralized laboratory and then tend to try to be moved out in a point of care setting. So when we think about point of care, this is trying to be where the patients are, as the name implies, point of care at the point of care. Um, however, and so there are more platforms um, just in the general field of molecular diagnostics for a variety of different infectious diseases. The, there are goals of trying to get um, tests with the same type of performance characteristics, tests that are just as good closer to where the patient is. And so um, there is the movement, but it's, it's definitely harder to do than, um, for example, these antigen tests that, as I could say, it, the, the example I, I gave you in performing it is a pregnancy test that you can buy, uh, you know, at a pharmacy and, and perform at home. They are easy to use, uh, easy to interpret, and oftentimes um, can be done more readily at a point of care. Again, this has an impact on turnaround time, um, not only the test performance itself, but if you need to transport it somewhere. Um, but then thinking about, um, you know, performance here, again, um, tends to have better performance with molecular tests compared to antigen tests. Um, so I think um, I want to take a moment here and read this question here before I get too far away from talking about um, mechanism. So the question is, does the threshold for a positive test result vary based on the limit of detection of the test, i.e. does a lower sensitivity require a higher threshold and how is the CT the CT or the crossing threshold for SARS-CoV-2 determined in an RT-PCR? Um, so there's a lot of great questions within that. So let me um, take it one by one. So does the threshold for a positive test result vary based on the limit of detection? Um, yes, and so uh, when these assays are developed, and, and this gets a little bit to you know, the second part of your question as well, when these assays are developed, you take some known quantity of virus and you put it through your assay and you look to see, um, you know, in, in the optimization and development stage of test development, you are watching those crossing thresholds, you are designing your assay, you're going to say, okay, where am I setting my, my threshold, my limit for saying that this is detected versus not detected? Where's my cutoff going to be? And you do this with known, you know, you do it with known concentrations of virus. Initially, you do it with known samples that are, are known to be positive versus negative or, or to be can, containing virus versus not. And you test it along the way. And during that optimization, you are looking to see, okay, where is my cutoff going to be? And it tends to be in looking at those cutoffs and we can go into ROC curves of thinking about receiver operator curves where you're really balancing sensitivity versus specificity um, when thinking about a cutoff of when you say something is is more is is detected versus not. So a short answer that I haven't done very shortly is yes, absolutely limited detection does play a role in the sensitivity of the assay. Um, one thing that is really important to think about and in, in talking about how CT thresholds are determined here is that an important distinction here when we're talking about laboratory diagnostics is the difference between what we call analytical sensitivity versus clinical sensitivity. And so all that I am talking about here in limit of detection really talks about analytical sensitivity is how do I know my test performs, what is the limit of detection, how much virus can is my test going to be able to pick up if it is there. That is very different than the question of clinical sensitivity, which is talking about a disease state. Can the test that I develop 
accurately pick up or detect if someone or not someone is infected or not or has disease or not and that is in the broader context of everything about specimen collection and processing and presentation for your patient so it's it's one thing to develop a test using known controls with known viral loads in a very controlled environment to determine limit of detection and your analytical sensitivity of your test and the crossing thresholds and, and knowing exactly what your curve is going to look like. It is a very different thing to then have an infected patient try to get an accurate, a, a good specimen, a high quality specimen, make sure that specimen is not um, compromised in any way while it's trying to get to your test make sure the test is performed accurately and um, all in the context of identifying the appropriate window to diagnose your patient. And these are all challenges associated with SARS-CoV-2 test, CoV testing. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the specimen type to begin with um, that used largely was the nasopharyngeal swab. Again, um, you know, feel free to chime in if, if you want to, but if anyone has had one of those, they are not comfortable. Um, they are, in fact, pretty un uncomfortable. And so, historically, from a lab perspective, you know, we've we've used NP swabs for other things, and it is a common risk that the specimen you get collected is not going to be that good because the individual collecting them is going to, you know, might be shy about shoving the swab as far up as they needed to, or to really get that good specimen. So, NP swabs are historically at risk for being poorly collected specimens and, and not really being what we need in the laboratory or what is, you know, the same as the controlled environment of a, a lab development or the validation assay. Um, and then the other issue that we, you know, face a lot, especially with COVID-19, is bet best understanding the viral load dynamics. Um, you know, when do you test a patient? So if you catch them early before their viral load is really ramped up, um, you know, are you really going to get the specimen that has the, the highest quantity? And you could end up getting a clinical false negative in that, yes, that patient is is infected and is going to um, become infectious and, and have disease, but right now your test says it's negative. And so the timing of test collection. So all of that um, plays an important role in clinical sensitivity. Um, and so Hannah, I'm sorry if that, <laughs> please clarify if I didn't even touch on what you were trying to get at, but, but that might've been more information than you were trying to get with that question. Um, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, okay, good. Uh, I'll jump in just this slide and this is just a snapshot. I refreshed this. Um, uh, so you can go on the FDA's website and look at all of the EUAs that have been designated. And I refresh this and, and hopefully I remember correctly here. Um, this is all of the, the EUAs. And, and remember, I said that first EUA was designated on March 12th of 2020. Here we have EUAs and I didn't look at it in the past few days, but it looks like the last EUA was, was given or designated on um, um, February 1st. And so um, looking at you know, the, and, and many since then. And so I think that there are now, and this is what I'm forgetting, I think there's now over 200, it might be around 206 EUAs that have been designated for molecular diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2. So 200 different tests that are available now um, out there. And, you know, some might be the same test, but but um, gotten approval for some other specific use. You can see here the Cepheid test, they just got approval for a, com a combined test that does um, SARS-CoV-2, influenza, and RSV. So you can see we're starting to riff a bit on the ideas of what's been going on. Um, but there's just, there's a lot of tests out there. Um, so what happens in the process, and part of what I was asked to talk about is, okay, how do, how do things get implemented? So um, these companies just went, right, they go through, um, they, they get their data, they do all this test development, um, they get an emergency use authorization, um, but but labs don't get to just go pick something up and start using it. And so that's that's the process in general. Even with an FDA approved in vitro diagnostic, an IVD, a laboratory would not just to get, say, oh, I'm going to start running that. You, I'm going to just put a quick order in and then tomorrow I'll be able to run this. No, laboratories themselves have to do what we call um, validation versus verification. 
And so there, there's two different things in, and the word here you're, you'll see is verification. So we use the word verification when something has been approved, either with the, the IVD approval or an EUA approval. Some company or someone else has put in the work to develop a test and get the initial approval of it. Every laboratory then that wants to use that then has to verify the product. And what they're doing here is saying, okay, now in my space with my laboratorians, with my clinical specimens, with my reporting system, everything about my unique laboratory space, I'm gonna verify that I can get the same accuracy or the same type of answers using this test as the people who made it did. And so to begin using any of this, there, um, there had to be this verification process, which re is, um, requires running a set number of tests in your lab, comparing it to a control or comparing it to some type of gold standard. The process varies depending on what you're trying to verify, but comparing it to a known answer to say, can I get the right answer? Whether it's detected or not detected, can I reliably get the right answer? Can I get it over multiple days? If I run the same specimen over multiple days, do I get it each time? Things like that. So, you know, depending on the bandwidth and the capacity of the laboratory, this can take quite a while. Um, you know, some lab settings in a normal environment, it can take weeks to months to get something verified simply because all of the people that are trying to do this testing are also trying to do the diagnostic testing on a day to day operations that are keeping people healthy. And so, you know, saying something of, oh, yeah, I'd love to you know, try to help you diagnose meningitis, but I have to go over here and run these three samples for this verification. You have to decide what you get to do with limited resources. And so it can be a slow process. And so this example, again, I just wanted to show that there had to be protocols put in place for laboratories when these EUAs came out. It wasn't something that you could just pick up off the shelf somewhere and just start using the next day. Labs had to have processes in place for determining, um, you know, the accuracy of the tests in their environment. And so this was guidance from the American Society for Microbiology for laboratories of, of trying to verify uh, these tests. Okay, so where did bottlenecks happen? So, you know, say we, we've got the lab, uh, we've got an EUA, we've got a test, we now, we've got it verified in our lab. What's going to happen? Why Why wasn't it easy? Why didn't we just have the answers? So I really like this um, uh, this image. This was stuff out of Sacramento that I was able to, to pull in where they were identifying some hot spots. Um, so here, um, you know, part of it was one, getting people to, to test, getting the testing location set up. And everyone thought, heck, if we just can get testing locations out there swabbing people, we just need to get the swabs, right? Let's get to the people, let's get the swabs, let's set up all of these testing sites, and then we'll send them to the lab and they'll do it easy peasy. Well, that became a, a huge bottleneck because then the labs all became overwhelmed and, and organizing these swabs and getting them to the right location. And one of the biggest surprises that I think a lot of operations people, a lot of people who do this on the day-to-day -day knew was gonna be a problem, but it was hard to convince others that it was gonna be a problem was just this simple um, keeping track of swabs. You know, so you've got these labeled swabs, you need to get that person's name, you know, if, if we've got a positive result, it's meaningless if we don't know who it was, where it was collected, when it was collected, and how to get that information back to someone. So just the idea of registering swabs and getting that data into the lab information systems and keeping track of it and the, having the people to, to get this number of swabs is a huge bottleneck. And then getting them to the laboratories and hoping that the laboratories don't go down, right? So if someone's got a backup and, and they're they're platform broke down or they had some type of shortage that then created a burden on all of the other labs that were trying to handle these really high volumes of tests. Um, and so, you know, that was the, the first part. And um, as I said about like platforms being on, the, the second problem that came into place was um, the, the reagents themselves. So, um, here we were hitting the labs with the need saying, okay, or the demand saying, okay, we need this testing done. And then all the labs, all these EUAs were made and then we needed to buy them and purchase them up. 
And it, again, was a huge bottleneck and continues to be problematic of keeping your reagents in stock. And so something that happened very early on is as labs, individuals' labs were saying, okay, now, I mean, just pulling from, from images here, say, okay, Cepheid has an EUA test available. I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to verify that in my laboratory. I'm going to take a few weeks. I'm going to make sure I can do that there. I've spent three weeks verifying it in my lab. Yep, I've got it working. Sure, I can do all of your testing now. And then two days later, uh-oh, Cepheid has run out of reagents. They're telling me it's on back order and I can't get any kits. So never mind. No, I can't do testing. And then the next thing is, oh, well, Roche is, has a test now. And they say that they can get me reagents. Okay, now I'm going to spend three to four weeks verifying the Roche assay. And I've got that up and going. And I've got that one going. So this process would go, oh, never mind. Roche has lost its reagents. They don't have it. Or never mind, they can get me reagents, but they can't get me the equipment. So now I'm going to get a third one. So that's why you have laboratories um, similar to our own local laboratories you know, I'm I'm in touch with a lot of the local laboratories and we they are running three to four to five different assays simply because we kept running out of reagents. We could not have guaranteed capacity for doing this testing. Um, it's been very interesting. We've run out of things and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end. We've run out of things that we did not imagine we would ever run out of. So that was, um, you know, the bottleneck. A lot of the focus was was on these diagnostic tests, um, but I do want to spend a bit of time talking about serology testing. Um, and so knowing that that we might have, you know, learners with different levels here of, of knowledge of immunology, this ends up being a pretty busy slide, but I really liked how it highlighted so many components of serology testing and what comes into play here. And so if, if we start up here, we start with our, our virus, really emphasis on that spike or that S protein, which is taken up by an immune cell. Um, and we have antigen presenting cells. So they're the ones that take that, that antigen and, and say, tell our immune system, hey, I've got something here. Come over here. Look at me. Look at me. And it triggers our immune activation and, and largely our antibody production. And so here we have that process happening um, and we are getting antibodies that are made and we've got two types of antibodies that we're focusing on here, IgM and IgG. Historically, and, and this is a, the general sentiment when we're thinking about diagnostic testing or serological testing for infectious diseases, the IgM antibody is, is thought to pop up first and then go away naturally within the course of infection. Whereas IgG comes a little bit later uh, peaks a little bit later, tends to decrease in, in its level over time, even naturally, but is um, always is always there. And so it remains at this certain level over time. And so we see both of these antibodies present. The idea then, and, and we can visualize it here using another lateral flow assay, is developing tests that would help us identify the IgG and the IgM antibodies. So the same type of idea happens. And again, reminder, we've got a, a key down here for what we've got going on in this slide. But here we have um, uh, the probe. So we've got our S protein here, again, with some type of detector or probe on it. So we've got our antigen available. And then we also have a control antibody with, a, with its own probe. And here what we have, we put our, our blood specimen, so our sample here uh, goes in and you can see in, in this example, we've got a little antibody in it. So when the, the blood sample goes on, we've got our antibody and it is going to bind. If, if the antibody is against SARS-CoV-2, against the antigen in question, it's going to, to bind it. And just like in our antigen assay, we've got these, these lines. So we've got an IgM line, an IgG line, and a control line. In this case, these are antibodies that are against antibodies. So this is an anti-IgM antibody, an anti-IgG, and then a control antibody against our control, remember. So if we have the antibodies present against these specific antigens, they cross along, they get captured at their respective band along the way, and we'll see detection. And so theoretically, the, the way this would work is it would help us distinguish between different disease presentations. So we could essentially, you know, try to clarify between an early, middle and late infection based on the type of antibodies we have detected. So early would be suggestive of, you know, an IgM alone without an IgG. 
uh, middle being both IgM and IgG, and late being IgG. Now, the reason I'm, I'm kind of adding disclaimers or being, you know, theoretically, we know from antibody testing for other disease presentations, it is not always this clear cut. IgM and IgG do not always behave how we want them to behave. And so that has been a lot of the challenges, and I'm happy to go into more detail about that if anyone's interested. Um, but associated with serology or not challenges, but a lot of the suspicion or skepticism saying that we're not sure how we can really interpret these yet because we just don't have enough data. And we know that there are challenges associated with others. And I'm recognizing that I'm, I'm talking more than I, I intended to talk. And so I'll just show that this is just another table again, kind of comparing here. We've got antibody testing and what it can and can't do uh, compared to molecular and antigen tests, and, and those slides are available. I did want to just highlight here this one slide, again, thinking about point of care assays. Um, this was an interesting Cochrane review that, that compared point of care assays, so rapid molecular um, and rapid antigen tests to what's currently considered a gold standard or reference standard of the RT-PCR. Um, and just looking at overall sensitivity and specificity, um, recognizing that there are real concerns with sensitivity. And this is, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, clinical performance of, of sensitivity of especially the rapid antigen, but even concerns in, in sensitivity at some point uh, with rapid molecular compared to our, our gold standard or our reference standard. Um, so knowing that you do lose something in most cases when you, when you um, think about turnaround time or, or changing your platform. Um, this is something that, that I wanted to have a reference if we wanted to get into a deeper conversation about sensitivity and specificity, um, thinking about pretest probabilities and, and things like that, but really what is the impact of sensitivity and specificity on, on interpretation of results? So I think, you know, if, if we were to look at this very briefly, when we think about a pretest probability, it's like before you perform a test, you know, someone walks in and says, what is the likelihood that they have disease? Do they have the right symptoms? Do they have the right exposures? Um, uh, things like that. What's the likelihood? And then once we run a test, we think about something called the post-test probability. Based on the results of our test, what is the likelihood that, for example, given a negative test result, what's the likelihood that they have an infection? What's the chance that it might be wrong? And this is where sensitivity really comes into play. So if we just look at a single time point, say you have a, a, a pretest probability of something like 50%. With a higher sensitivity test, there is a lower likelihood that a patient will, ha will not be infected with a negative result than with a lower sensitivity rate test. You are going to miss more true infections with a lower sensitivity result. And that was really the point of including this. And we can dive into it more if there are specific questions about that. I did want to acknowledge, you know, there's a lot of ways that we continue to talk about diagnostic testing and ways that this can be improved. I've, you know, hit a bit on the rapid point of care. Um, I showed you in that EUA these combination tests, so combining influenza and RSV and SARS-CoV-2 into the same platform. Um, you know, a lot of push of can we be doing this at home? Is there a way to get testing for everyone, make it more accessible, things like that? Um, and then changing specimen types. Is there ways that, for example, saliva might be something that we could access a little more easily? Um, and so could we expand there? And then just finally, um, you know, some barriers along the way, and then I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and, and dive into more of a discussion. Uh, this is something that I, I wanted to share and, and just put up for your guys' resource about the point of care diagnostic uh, chain value. So we talked a, a little bit about, um, you know, just IVD development uh, in general, but thinking about the types of considerations, and I won't read through all of these, but you guys have these slides of the types of things that come into play when thinking about getting a point of care assay made. Again, we're asking someone to spend a lot of money developing something. And so before we do, we think about all of these different factors in there. And this is just all just basic point of care, not even you know considering all of the concerns of a pandemic and reagent shortages and burdens on, on verification and things like that. So it's these were already complicated processes that required careful consideration. 
and, you know, doing them. It wasn't that anyone just didn't want to do things or, you know, was too lazy or didn't want to invest. It was just that these are challenging, challenging processes to do, especially in a pandemic. And then I really, uh, this article is great. I wanted to point it out and, and highlight one of the, the sentiments from it. This was uh, an opinion article from the editor of the um, Journal of Clinical Microbiology. They did this special issue where they pulled together all of these articles related to diagnostic testing uh, for SARS-CoV-2. And I mean, he, he shared a lot about the experience and I think it resonated with a lot of clinical microbiologists. But this one was really interesting. Like, you know, in reading some of these out, we did things that we would not have considered doing before. There were shortages of critical supplies in needing, including nasal pharyngeal swabs and viral transport meeting, media. Um, microbiologists were manufacturing and testing viral transport media. So things that we would just buy, you know, before the pandemic, if you suggested to a clinical microbiologist making their own transport media, you would have been laughed out of the room. That's ridiculous. Why would we ever do that? And it got to the point where we had directors of clinical laboratories working on weekends, making media and, and verifying and testing that media just so that we could keep up with demand of testing. We were in conversations with 3D printed nasal pharyngeal swabs. Um, I had a colleague uh, who was working in, where was she at the time? She was either in New York or, or Philadelphia. I don't know if she had moved yet. You know, I reached out to her and said, hey, are you, are you guys using 3D printed swabs for yours? And her response, a bit tongue in cheek, was essentially, if you, got, if you can fit it in someone's nose, we are using it. And it was that point where just the, the demand, I mean, it was unreal. And so I wanted to emphasize or show this to one, hopefully, I had it pulled up. Let's see if it pulls up here. Um, I included this link for you guys. They actually, supply shortages have gotten so bad within the laboratories that ASM has created this, this website that shows supply shortages and what the demand is and where it's going. And it's not just COVID-19 supply shortages. This is non-COVID. So all of these manufacturers that make COVID testing material make other testing material. And we have run out of other things needed to diagnose infectious diseases because of the pandemic and what things have been repurposed to do. So I thought this was just a really um, uh, cool thing and I did not plan for this to go back to my slides. Shoot, that was poor planning on my part. Um, let, me, let me find my slides. There we go, oh, that was nice, okay. Oh, and that was the last slide. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking. I know we're close on time. I'm really sorry. I'm gonna stop sharing. I'd love to hear any more questions or, or conversations from the group um, about this topic or any thoughts you guys had about the reading. Um, okay, so a great question in the chat box. So given the fact that serology tests are not necessarily able to be used for true diagnostics at this time, what's the main reason this option is being utilized? So um, right now, the option for serology testing, and, and this is going to be my opinion, I will tell you, you will talk to other people who, that will have different opinions, um, but uh, I would say the CDC and a lot of people are on board with this, is that it provides a public health epidemiology exposure type of option of saying, okay, um, you know, we, we feel comfortable with the fact that having antibodies likely means you were exposed at some point. So in doing so, in doing antibody testing, we can get a better sense of who has been exposed. The reason it has limited utility and why I am, you know, with our current assays, a proponent of not reporting this to individuals is we don't know what that means. Okay, if you were previously exposed, we do not have a good handle on if you can be reinfected or if you can be, you know, infected and while you might not be symptomatic, transmit it to others. So. Some people think, I have heard it said this way, that this is paternalistic, that give people information and, and trust them to handle it. We will say as, as laboratory directors in the field, we know that's not the case, that people do dangerous things with information and you can't necessarily trust them. And knowing the accuracy or limitations of a test is really important before sharing information. Um, and so uh, there is, um, concerns with reporting results, even if you try to put every disclaimer on it that we don't know what this means, don't act differently, people will, will act differently. And so I would say right now it's an epidemiological standpoint. 
hopefully we better understand um, what the, the antibodies mean um, and, and might be able to use it for more in the future. Um, and then a good follow-up, do current serology tests distinguish SARS-CoV-2 from other common coronaviruses? Another great, great question, and it will depend on the assay, um, is, is my understanding. And I haven't done an in-depth comparison of all of the antibody tests specifically, so feel free, feel free to chime in if anyone has more specific info. But, um, you know, the, there is a lot of cross-reactivity within um, the, or, or cross-occurrence of antigens within coronaviruses, and so there is a high risk for cross-reactivity, and the likelihood is there is some level of cross-reactivity. We see this with antibody testing for a lot of different pathogens, where we see cross-reactivity of parasitic antibodies, of other viral antibodies, and so the specificity is a big concern. I do know that there are antibody assays in place that will help distinguish um, between, for example, a vaccine response to SARS, a, a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine versus a natural infection, and that's the type of antibody antigen the antibody recognizes. But cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses is a, is a risk um, for serology testing, and it will just vary depending on the test. Um, David, do you have anything to, to add on, on knowledge on that that you're aware of? Awesome. Okay. Um, and then another question, were there any diagnostic serological differences between the original COVID-19 strain and other strains that have come up like the UK and the South African? So um, my understanding at this point, and I was just on a call where we were all talking about that uh, right now, to my understanding, um, all of the primers, and so primers is in reference to the specific part of the nucleic acid or the genes that are being targeted um, by these molecular assays um, are still performing well uh, with the variants that have come in place in terms of the molecular tests. Um, uh, the antibody tests, I'm not sure. So when you think about, and you know, our virologists can chime in with this more, but when we think about why viruses change, um, it is often, you know, some type of natural selection within the immune system of what's being recognized and what's being promoted and what's being transmitted. And so oftentimes, you know, some of your, your surface, your like, for example, the spike protein might be um, under the most pressure to be changing, whereas a lot of uh, what's being targeted, I think there's one assay that, one molecular assay that's looking at the spike protein, but most of them look at genes that are not spike and might be less sensitive to that variant. I will say it is a, a basic tenant within molecular diagnostics in, in clinical micro labs is you are supposed to continue checking um, your diagnostic assays to make sure that they are catching the strains that are out there. So we do with this with flu. We are supposed to be watching for strains and variants of influenza that aren't detected by our di diagnostic tests. That goes into the question of public health versus clinical microbiology. Whose responsible is it to be, you know, kind of watching for these? So it's a great question. It's a big topic right now. All right, we've got two questions here. So, uh, ugh, okay, maybe it's a comment. So someone's had multiple NP swab COVID tests. Um, so sorry, you've gone through that, but acknowledging there are drastic differences in the collection of the specimen each time. So would these differences potentially yield results of false not detected? Absolutely. Things like depth of the, the swab insertion, one nostril, two amount of twirling, absolutely. So thank you for sharing that, um, Ashley, that personal experience. Yes, yes, specimen quality, making sure you get, you know, the, the adequate specimen absolutely has an impact on sensitivity of the test. And so it's really helpful to hear that you've experienced it collected in so many different ways um, that, yeah, that it would definitely have an impact on that. All right, do you foresee any new diagnostic testing in the pipeline that could solve for an overwhelmed global testing infrastructure, such as take-home testing results in real time? Uh, yes, I think we'll definitely move that. I think that there is a demand. Um, the world 
uh, the diagnostic testing never moves fast enough to be inclusive for resource limited settings. We see that for a lot of our disease presentations that, that it is never inclusive, never cheap enough, never fast enough to really get testing where we need it in resource limited um, uh, settings. And so that is a, a push for a lot of different diagnostics, but it, there's also challenges with it. And unfortunately, it's some about it will being willing to invest the money in answering that um, type of question and, and making sure um, resources are dedicated to it. So yes, I do think we're going to keep pushing that way, but but whether or not we get highly accurate, cost effective, accessible tests in a matter of time is, is going to be a good question. OK, um, next question. So is a COVID test is a false positive or a false negative? Is there any specific protocol for those working the laboratories running the PCR and those administering the test to follow in order to prevent false positives and negatives? Yes, that is another great question. So there's a lot of um, quality control perspective that is put in place uh, to prevent um, the risk of false positives and false negatives from a technical standpoint. So if we think about false negatives, the first, the first uh, kind of control is what we consider an internal control. If we're doing something like a molecular assay where we want to amplify nucleic acid, we need to make sure that nucleic acid can be amplified in that specimen. There's something like an inhibitor, we call them, that would make that process, that chemistry not work. So what we do is we have internal controls in an assay that we know should work, regardless of if someone's infected, the internal control should work. But if it doesn't, that is an indication to us that something is, has an inhibited the process, and so we cannot trust a negative. So that helps from a technical perspective of eliminating the risk of a potential false negative. When we think about false negative or false positives, something clinical laboratories do is really watch um, percent positivity rates to see how many positives we're getting in a run. Are there pauses or detected assays right next to each other? Because that's a risk of uh, contamination of a false positive result saying, okay, this specimen didn't really have it, but the one next to it had a really high, high viral load and we had contamination. So that helps from a very technical standpoint of, of watching things like that um, follow up on concerns for false positives. Now, there is what we call pre-analytical steps. So that what Ashley helped, helped me talk about in terms of specimen collection. We have no idea if the specimen was collected well at the beginning or appropriately. So when we get a negative, we have no ability to follow up and say, you know, was that a good collection? You know, we can't speak to that at all. So that is why having our clinicians, our healthcare providers truly understand the pre-analytical variables that come into play for test performance is critical. And I'll say a lot of people don't understand all of those steps. Let me know, Marianne, if that didn't address all what you were thinking about uh, for the false positive and negative, and I'll, I'll try to circle back. Um, okay, with vaccines now being administered, how do you see the testing process change, if all, if at all? For example, do you re recommend people get tested less often as, as they become fully vaccinated, uh, given they don't have symptoms, um, so that those who are, uh, aren't tested vaccinated have more access? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, we still have a lot to learn about what vaccination is going to do. One, how long is it is um, how robust of an immune response will we have? How durable of an immune response? How long will it last? Will we stay protected forever? There's also a question about if I'm vaccinated and I can't become symptomatic, um, can I still transmit it? Am I still going to be carrying infection? And so I think what I would consider surveillance testing, so testing asymptomatic individuals who have been vaccinated, will help give us a sense of, of some of that data that we don't necessarily have right now. So I think there's still utility in surveillance testing even when someone has been vaccinated. Um, it could all change as we learn more about the, how vaccines work, um, of of what we anticipate, how how long it lasts, and so I think it is still subject to change, and we need to be paying attention to it carefully. So, um, I, I think that's a good question and a good thing to think about. 
Um, okay, next question. Is there an approved take home COVID-19 test? If, oh, sorry, if there is an approved test, do you have concerns about effective specimen collection potentially leading to false negatives? Absolutely, yes, I do. Um, and, uh, you know, we think about the context of take home tests. It's a, it's a balance, right? We want access, accessible testing. We want to reach hard to reach places, but then we lose some control and we lose some contact, right? So it's control and not just specimen collection, but it's also performing the test appropriately, interpreting the results appropriately, and then following up appropriately. And we think about this for a lot of things. Um, STI, sexually transmitted infection testing. You know, there's big the big pushes for trying to get self-collected swabs that, or, you know, at-home tests that would help you get a diagnosis. Some are a strong proponent of that saying it will get people to be able to get a diagnosis, will reduce transmission because, you know, people don't have access to care, at least they'll know. And that's a great reason to try to get those resources. But there's then a risk of, okay, now someone's got a diagnosis and they don't have a healthcare provider to talk to about what to do with those results. Um, or maybe they didn't do the test right. So like you've said, a potential false negative, now they have a false sense of security. They might not have performed the test well or accurately. They've gotten a negative and they think they're good to go. And so now they perform actually with riskier behaviors thinking that they've got the pass because they've been a test. So absolutely, that is, I think, a concern and has to be balanced by a lot of different stakeholders in the question. Um, is there a difference between a finger stick antibody test and a blood draw? Um, I'm guessing, I think you mean in terms of, uh, for example, sensitivity or specificity of the tests. Um, I have not seen any data, but I will be honest, I haven't specifically looked at that question. I would anticipate, the easy answer is probably yes, that there, there's probably some difference. Um, and will you see this, while I can't speak to it for SARS-CoV-2, um, you know, we know uh, uh, about other assays where we've done finger stick versus a blood draw. Um, and it tends to be that you do tend to have increased sensitivity well, I guess I'll say it this way. In most protocols and most algorithms right now, a finger stick assay does not have the performance where we just leave it at that. Oftentimes they are backed up with um, a higher performing test that requires a more invasive specimen where it's recommended that you do something else. And so I think that's a, a pretty safe general answer, but I will admit that I don't know specifically on that. Are rapid COVID-19 tests reliable enough to trust? Should one who tests negative from such tests still take another PCR test? I think there are a lot of nuances to that question that, um, that are important to consider. So I think um, the phrase of reliable enough to trust is important of what do we mean by trust it? Um, what is it going to do about your actions? What's it going to do about the patient's activity when we trust it? Um, what context do we share the information with? And, um, you know, then the question of if they test negative, uh, should they take another test? So the good example here in the algorithms that are being proposed for, for example, antigen, rapid antigen tests and um, molecular tests really depend on, again, getting back to this point of pre-test probability. And so in a patient, with a high likelihood of disease, even a, a perfect test, well, you have a risk of false negative. So if you really think, and there's no test that's perfect. So in my head, there were quotes, I'll put them now, perfect. There is no single diagnostic test that is perfect. So even in a test um, that is good, if you have a really high pre-test probability that someone has disease, you have a, a higher risk of false negatives, meaning that your test, you could still miss them. And therefore you wanna keep that in mind. So, you know, we've had tests where um, it's harder with COVID-19 because the symptoms are shared by other things. But a great example is, is a test like, or, or something like syphilis. You know, you've got syphilis with a great exposure history, classic signs and symptoms. The test comes back negative you want to question that test result, even if it's a good high performing test, because it was you were so certain that the patient had this disease, you question your lab test result. 
On the reverse side of that, if you have a, someone with a really low T pretest probability, they have no signs and symptoms, they have no exposure history, then you take a test, you really have to be worried about false positive results. I have a great story about this, uh, about salmonella that I can tell you sometime, but in those situations, it really matters. So when we think about pretest probability, we think about asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals for COVID-19. What the recommendations are right now is if you are using a, for symptomatic individuals where there is a suspicion for COVID-19, if you do a rapid antigen test and it is positive, you are good to go and interpret that. And that is a, a valid result that's accurate. Most would recommend you stop there. If it is negative, however, in a patient with a high pretest probability because they're symptomatic, recommendations are you, you back up a negative with a molecular test result. So you do not stop in the algorithm and trust the negative. Now the reverse is used for asymptomatic individuals. So you have an asymptomatic individual, meaning they have a lower pretest probability. It's hard with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 because we have so many individuals who are asymptomatic but say it's a lower pretest probability, then when you have a negative antigen test, current recommendations, um, if you were using, and this is a big caveat because a lot of people don't recommend using antigen tests in an asymptomatic individuals, but if you were, they would say with a negative test, you stop, but with a positive test, because of the risk of false positives in a patient population with a low pretest probability, you should actually back up the positive test within molecular test and really confirm that. So that's why I say, again, for that question um, about the lot of nuances about when you would back it up versus not. All right, and I know I'm going over, but I just wanna answer your questions and I'm happy to stay longer. So I apologize, I don't mean to be disrespectful of anyone's time. If you need to leave, feel free to leave, but I wanna keep answering questions if you guys still have them. So the last one is, what have you noticed about the method of testing preferred by individuals? Is it the NP swab or saliva specimens or um, other individuals uh, prefer to have when getting tested? Um, so I think it varies. You know, I, I think there's a lot of personal preference. I think if if there was a lot of messaging and it came out strong of this specimen is absolutely fine, this is the way to go, then I think most people would not prefer an NP swab. Um, and uh, and would probably prefer a less a less invasive nasal swab. Um, some people, I think, is an important consideration. Some people might not want to spit in a cup, or that might be uncomfortable to them, and would rather swab their nose. Or they would, you know, rather than someone else swabbing their mouth, they would rather swab their nose. So I do think that there is some personal preference, and it's really interesting. You can be surprised by personal preference. You know. Some people really hate needles and never will want to give blood um, and would prefer to do some other type of invasive, you know, collection or uh, we test stool a lot. Um, some people are not squeamish at all about providing a stool sample. Some people hate the idea of it. And so I think it's a good consideration and, um, you know, thinking about test development, it's something people definitely think about is what, what are people willing to do? All right. Sorry again. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Powers Fletcher, for answering all of our students' questions and for an amazing presentation. Um, students, if you have to go, um, yeah, please feel free. This, this is the end of class. But thank you so much for presenting to us, Dr. Powers Fletcher, again. It was amazing. Oh, absolutely. Thank you all for your great questions. Oh, it was so fabulous. Really, really enjoyed answering them. Great course. I'm so glad you guys put this together. So thanks for the invite. Of course.